You may be seated. Let's pray. What a glorious thing to contemplate, O oh Lord, as we look back at the cross and we look forward to glory. And every step in between, you keep your children. You keep them by your power. You keep them in your love. You have purchased them with the blood of your Son, and you have pledged your promise by the indwelling Holy Spirit. These things are our comfort. You, O oh God, are our security, our safety, our hope, our joy. We ask right now by the power of your Holy Spirit to have um, an understanding of your word. Would you speak through your word to us this morning? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 26 and 27 this morning. You parents may have had the experience of having your children ask for something. Maybe help with homework or help with something to eat. and They don't always know what they need. And so a parent is attuned to listen through the question to meet the genuine need, to meet the real need. You men may have had a similar experience in a hardware store. You're trying to solve something at home, something has gone awry, something has broken, and you show up in one of those aisles. And somebody in an orange vest or a blue vest is coming to your rescue and says, can I help you find something? Yes, I need a Freeville stack and a Neuvenhofer. Yes, those are on aisle nine. <laughs> and hopefully someone who knows what they're talking about can decipher through your silly explanation what the real problem is and what the right solution is. In the Christian life, we have something of a similar dilemma. We are handicapped in our ability to understand our true needs. We often don't even know what the right question is. We don't know what to ask for. We might wonder, how will I endure life in a broken universe? How can I possibly persevere in and through unknown, unforeseen trials? How will I know God's will for my life? How would I know what to pray for? These questions are addressed in our text this morning. And not necessarily by a theological answer not by some exegetical development in Scripture, but by a person, the person of the Holy Spirit and His role personally, experientially to give help in prayer. That is the point of our text this morning. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, bringing our prayers into conformity with the will of God. This is a significant role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, and, and everyone who has been born again, everyone who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and has experienced transformation, has also become a temple for the Holy Spirit. Individually, you, Christian, are a habitation, a dwelling place for the Spirit of Almighty God. He has taken up residence in you. He lives in you, and, and we've been watching his ministry in Romans chapter 8 of, as our pledge of security, our down payment on our future glory, the one who testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and here this morning, the one who helps us in our weakness, specifically in prayer. Let's read our text this morning, verses 26 and 27 of Romans chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
This is a really remarkable insight into the secret ministry of the Holy Spirit that you and I may not be aware of unless God revealed it to us in this text. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, bringing into conformity with God's will our own prayers. We're going to look at this in two parts. First of all, we don't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes. This is verse 26. We don't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes. Paul begins verse 26 with the phrase, in the same way, in the same way, or, or likewise. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. This is not a reference to verse 25 or verse 24 or the, the groaning of creation. This takes us all the way back to verse 16 to the last time that Paul was describing a ministry of the Holy Spirit. In verse 16, the ministry of the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. He testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. That is the internal testimony, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, that we have a filial affection, a filial relationship, that is a, a father-child relationship with the God of the universe. And in the same way that the Holy Spirit, resident in a believer, testifies with that believer's spirit that indeed we are children of God. In the same way, the Holy Spirit personally, experientially, helps our weakness. Here, He is dwelling inside us, helping our prayer. How is this weakness described? Paul says, for we do not know how to pray as we should. And he's not talking about the manner of prayer here. We don't, we don't know in what manner we're supposed to pray, what posture, what location, the timing. That, that's not what he's talking about. He literally says, we do not know something. And that something is this whole phrase, what it is that we should pray for according to the need. We don't know what it is that we should be praying for that is obligated by whatever circumstance we happen to be in. There's a standard for prayer that is revealed here. There, there is something necessary, some necessity, something being demanded by our circumstances, and the content of our prayers ought to conform with those circumstances. They ought to conform to the reality of our situation. They ought to conform to our true needs in any given situation. And that is exactly what we in our weakness do not know. We don't know it. We don't know what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know what to pray. And the reasons we don't know what to pray fundamentally is because we are finite and we are fallible. We're finite and we're fallible. That is, we don't know everything and much of what we do know is wrong. You see, we have a small picture of things. We don't have the big picture we are like ants crawling around on the giant tapestry of God's universe, of God's timeline, of God's story. It's like examining the, the details of a, of a great giant photograph pixel by pixel. You're like an ant crawling across a pixel and that's all you can see. Our finitude demonstrates that we don't know everything. We don't have the big picture in view. In addition to that, we have a propensity towards self-focus. We think about ourselves. There's a reason that Jesus said that we should love others, specifically a man should love his wife even as he loves himself. The problem is we already love ourselves. We don't need any help loving ourselves. We don't need any help paying attention to ourselves. If only our love for others could get anywhere close to our love for self. If only our love for God or absorption with God could approximate our absorption with ourselves naturally. We also have a tendency toward a temporal perspective. We think in terms of the here and the now. We think in terms of this life. We, we seldom evaluate things on the scales of eternity. We seldom see our sufferings in the weight of the balance of the glory that is to be revealed. We often, in fact, desire to remove suffering. How much of our prayer life revolves around, God, will you take away this thorn in my side? 
And we're a good company in prayers like that. Many of the Psalms, in fact, reflect this kind of prayer. We also have indwelling sin that distorts our perspectives. And it wheedles its way into our prayer lives as well. The, the, the cry of our heart as we go to God in prayer is affected by what's inside of us. And there are distortions. And we get confused by external things, by pressures, by temptations, by trials. You know how easy it is just to conform your thinking to the people around you. You know how easy it is to be squeezed into the mold of this world. We know how easy it is just by entertainment choices or by the company we keep or just by long hours at work focused on things that we're supposed to be focused on at work can tend to shape what we value. And we can be confused by these things. We often make crazy requests under duress. Have you thought about when life is frantic and things are hard and the cares of the world are heavy? Have you thought about the things you've asked for? We're most likely not even aware of what our greatest needs are in a given situation. We might sense a problem. We might determine our own best solution and then ask God to make our proposal a reality. We really ought to be thankful for the things that God doesn't answer according to the way we ask. We don't know God's will. We certainly don't know His decretive will. That is what God has decreed from all eternity past. We, we don't know what He has planned and what He orchestrates and what He intimately works out in every detail by His sovereignty. We, we don't know that. There are secret things that belong to the Lord. But also I'm convinced we don't know his prescriptive will as well as we should. His prescriptive will is that which he's revealed to us in Scripture. What he tells us to know, promises he tells us to believe, things he tells us to avoid, things he tells us to do. But certainly if we knew his prescriptive will better, <laughs> that would no doubt help conform our cries to the Lord in, more in keeping with his will. We don't know his decretive will, it's a secret. We only know his prescriptive will as well as we know God's word. There are, of course, examples of prayer in Scripture that are not in accord with the will of God. That is, they weren't answered the way they were prayed. They actually weren't in keeping with what God had planned to do. You might be thinking of the Apostle Paul himself in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul suffered a lot of things. You can read the whole list in 2 Corinthians 11. And then he gives the description of his seeing the third heaven. That is, not the sky, not space, but the very throne room of God where God's visible presence is manifest spectacularly. And God got to, or Paul got to hear things that he couldn't tell us. You know, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you kind of thing. These are secret things, but they were enough to fuel Paul's eternal perspective for a lifetime of suffering. And God, in order to keep the Apostle Paul humble after the surpassing greatness of his vision, gave him a thorn in his side, a messenger of Satan. And we don't know what that is, but Paul pleaded with the Lord three times to remove it. And God didn't see fit to answer Paul's prayer the way Paul prayed it. Instead, the answer came, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul benefited from the humility. We benefit from the example of unanswered prayer or answered prayer differently than we even knew to ask. James chapter 4 verse 3 describes prayers that are not in keeping with the will of God. Prayers that are in fact asked according to worldly desires, lusts, and, and what James calls adulteries. Sometimes we pray things out of a desire because we are wed to the world. We are friends with the world. And worldly thinking invades our prayer life. And so we probably really should be thankful that God does not always give us whatever we can think of to ask. And not in the timing we think to ask it. 
If only we always had God's glory as our motivation. If only we had others' needs as our concern. If only we had our own Christ-likeness as our aim. If only we knew all possible outcomes for all contingencies. Then we might not have this weakness. What if Job, in his distress, could have known to pray for you personally? Lord, would you use these circumstances in my life for the exaltation of your glory, for the humiliation of Satan, and for the encouragement of all who will read about me for thousands of years to come? He couldn't know. He didn't know what God was up to. He didn't even know what Satan was up to behind the scenes. And he could not know how his own experiences have benefited you, Christian, thousands of years later. What if Joseph, in his suffering under injustice, could have known to pray for God's glory? What if Joseph had known to pray, God, you made promises to my brothers, specifically Judah, And if Judah dies, his line goes away. If there's a famine in the land that wipes out all the tribes of Israel, all my brothers, they they put me in this hole, then they sold me into slavery. They're unkind. They were jealous. Some of them were murderous. They're deceivers. They're liars. (laughs) But God, would you use those things that they intended for my harm? And would you intend them for my good? Would you, Romans 8, 28, my brother's evil actions... (laughs) Because if Judah dies and the line goes away, then the Messiah promised through Judah won't come, and I can't be forgiven of my sins, and neither can anybody else in all of future human history. What if Joseph could have prayed like that? Joseph didn't know what God was up to. He might have prayed, God, get me out of this hole. God, get me out of this prison. It's not right. It's unjust, unjust. What if Paul could have prayed with all knowledge? He prayed good prayers. You know who did pray according to the will of God? Jesus. In John 17, in the upper room discourse, an entire chapter devoted to God the Son's intercession on behalf of believers, even you and me personally, all those who would believe in the apostles' teaching. It's in the prayer. And he goes before his Father with perfect, flawless, intercessory prayer that gets answered. And we don't know what we should pray for. It's understandable. Even though we have lots of instruction on what to pray, right? Jesus gave us some instructions. Matthew 6, uh, 9 to 13, he, he said, pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, holyified, separated out, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's great content of prayer. Paul told Timothy, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. God instructed us what to pray through the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 5.20 says, give thanks always. If you're looking for content, there's some good content. Always express gratitude to God. And of course, there are instructions not just on the content of prayer, but also on the manner of prayer, how to pray. Jesus told us, don't pray in rote, in meaningless repetitions, mindlessness. And don't pray for show, but go inside. Go to the inner closet and shut the door and pray in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We have instructions about praying all the time. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. We are commanded to pray in the Spirit, Ephesians 6.18. 
And of course, there are promises about prayer. Cast all your cares upon him, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. And then we have a lot of examples of prayer in Scripture. If we were just to examine what is the content of Paul's prayer lists, what did the Apostle Paul, just by way of example, pray for? Well, he gave thanks for believers, for the progress of the gospel, for God's grace given to believers. He gave thanks that believers were enriched in God, in speech, in knowledge, and in spiritual gifts. He gave thanks that God would confirm true believers to the end, that Paul did not baptize many, but he preached the gospel. He gave thanks that God always leads believers in triumph. He gave thanks for God's indescribable gift. He gave thanks for all things. He gave thanks for believers' work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope in Christ. He gave thanks for God's election of believers. He gave thanks that believers received the word of God as God's word, not as man's word. He gave thanks for joy on account of believers. He gave thanks that believers' faith was enlarged and their love grew. Paul gave thanks for his own salvation. He gave thanks for spiritual strength. He gave thanks for all men and commanded us to give thanks for kings and rulers and those who are in authority. When it came to requests that Paul made, Paul asked that he could visit believers to make them strong, to encourage their faith, and to be refreshed by them. He asked the Lord for the salvation of the Jews. He requested unity of believers. He requested that believers would glorify God, that believers would be filled with joy and peace in believing, that they would abound in hope by the Holy Spirit. Paul asked that he would be rescued from evildoers for the service, for, for the service of the saints. He asked that the grace of the Lord would be with believers, that God would be glorified, that God would remove the thorn from his flesh, that believers would do right despite the consequences to Paul that the love of God would be with believers, that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with believers, that God would give to believers wisdom and knowledge of Him, that the eyes of believers' hearts might be opened to know the hope of His calling, the riches of the glory of His inheritance, and the surpassing greatness of His power. He prayed that God would strengthen believers in the inner man through His power, that Christ would dwell in believers' hearts through faith, that believers would be filled up to the fullness of God. Paul prayed for boldness and opportunity to preach the gospel. He prayed that believers' love would abound in real knowledge and discernment, that believers would exercise discernment. He prayed that believers would be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness to the glory and praise of God, that they would be filled with the knowledge of His will and spiritual wisdom and understanding, that believers would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, that they would please the Lord, that they would bear fruit of good works, that they would increase in the knowledge of God, that believers would be strengthened by God that they would attain steadfastness and patience, that they would abound in love for one another and for all people. He prayed that God would sanctify believers, that God would count believers worthy of their calling, that God would fulfill every desire for goodness and a work of faith, that God would comfort and strengthen believers' hearts in every good work and word, that the word of God would spread rapidly and be glorified. Paul prayed that he would be rescued from evil men, that he would that God would direct believers' hearts into the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Paul prayed that believers would submit to kings. Paul prayed that God would grant mercy to individuals and that the fellowship of believers' faith would be effective through knowledge of what is good. Paul went on to worship God for his power, his eternality, his wisdom, his mercies, his comfort in affliction, his power to do far more abundantly than what we could ask or think he praised God in prayer for his immortality, his invisibility, and his dwelling in unapproachable light. Paul prayed unceasingly, always, constantly, at all times. He prayed with the Holy Spirit's help and intercession. He prayed striving together with other believers. He prayed with perseverance, with petition for all the saints. He prayed with joy, with thanksgiving. He prayed in everything. He prayed devotedly, and he prayed alertly. The scriptures are not silent about what to pray for and how to pray. And yet, we find ourselves in our various circumstances, in times of need, still not knowing what to pray. I trust you've been there. God, I don't know what the need of this moment is. I don't know what the solution to this problem is. I'm not even really aware of what my deepest needs are in this. Take courage, Christian, and pray. 
Because as you pray, God's Holy Spirit dwelling in you intercedes. You need not worry that God might answer my foolish, short-sighted, or untimely prayer in a way that would be harmful to his children or contrary to his perfect will. Notice what Paul says here in verse 26. In the same way the Spirit helps our weakness, we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes. That is, he goes between, he pleads on behalf of. He is our go-between in prayer. And you know we have intercessory work done on our behalf by the second person of the Trinity, by the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he, Jesus, always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God making intercession for you, believer. And the Holy Spirit intercedes, not in heaven, but in you he dwells. And as a go-between between between you and the throne room of God, he intercedes in prayer. This is exactly what Jesus promised in John 14. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you. And he will be in you. And that promise to those disciples in the upper room was fulfilled in Acts 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and then the permanent indwelling of every believer with the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus went on to say in John 16, 7, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus did not leave his followers as orphans but sent another like him to be in them. And so we have the intercession of Jesus Christ, and and Jesus' intercession for us in heaven is judicial. That is, Jesus stands at the right hand of God and makes intercession in terms of sin for believers. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? (laughs) No one. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. Why? Because Jesus Christ, who died, yes, rather was raised, makes intercession on behalf of us on the basis of his work on the cross. Jesus died and was condemned so that all who are in him can never be condemned. And Jesus stands in the throne room of heaven pleading his own blood as our intercessory work on our behalf so that God can look on you, Christian, as if you have never sinned and as if you had always done everything right simply because he looked on his own son at the cross and saw him as the bearer of sin for everyone who would ever believe. Sins past, present, and future completely and totally paid at the cross for all who belong to Jesus Christ. He intercedes on our behalf. And Jesus' intercession is on the basis of our sin before a holy God. And we have another intercessor, the person of the Holy Spirit. And his intercession is not judicial. He is not our judicial advocate in heaven. He is our prayer advocate residing within us. And so when we pray, we do not pray to impress others. (laughs) Prayer for the Christian is a simple cry of help from the weak to the one who with limitless power and unstoppable love loves to give good things to his children. We do not know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And notice what Paul says about this intercession. It is done with groanings too deep for words, the end of verse 26. Literally with deep, wordless words groans. These are non-wordy groanings. <laughs> that is, they're unspoken. They're inexpressible. And we saw groaning in verse 22, the, the creation groans, longing for the glorification of God's children. The, the creation groans, frustrated. And we saw in the next verse, in verse 23 of Romans 8, that our own hearts groan because we are longing forward, eager for our adoption, the the final salvation, our glorification, the resurrection. And here the Spirit of God within us groans. 
And the similarity between these three groanings is the wordlessness of it. You can't hear articulated words from creation as it cranes its neck longing to see the glorification of the children of God. And and our own groanings of longing for heaven and longing for the resurrection and longing for our final adoption come often without articulation. Similarly here, the Holy Spirit's groaning in us is not articulated content. But the Spirit's groaning is not like the previous two. It's not marked by frustration and longing. The Spirit's unspoken communication is personal help in a time of need. Notice in verse 26, who is groaning? This is not the believer groaning wordlessly. Do you see it? The Spirit helps our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we should. The Spirit Himself intercedes on our behalf. He intercedes for us. This is not us groaning here in verse 26. This is the Holy Spirit groaning. This is not what some call a prayer language or a praying in tongues. This is wordless communication, non-verbal communication, non-vocalized communication, and it is the intercession by the Holy Spirit on our behalf as we pray. We pray, and we are weak, and we don't know what we should be praying for, as is necessary, as the need obligates us, and the Holy Spirit goes between us between us and the throne of God, with intercessory prayer on our behalf. And we don't know what He is communicating. His communication on our behalf is accomplished through deep, wordless groans, literally. If the Holy Spirit's intercession is wordless, then how can that communication be effective? Well, this leads us to the second aspect of the Holy Spirit's help in prayer for us. This is verse 27. I would summarize it this way. God knows what is prayed because the Holy Spirit intercedes. If they are deep, wordless groans, how does anybody understand it? Well, God understands. God knows what is prayed. God knows the content of the Holy Spirit's wordless groanings. Why? Because it is the Holy Spirit that is interceding for us. He who searches the heart, Paul says in verse 27 knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints according to God or according to the will of God. The point of verse 27 is this. The Holy Spirit intercedes. Therefore, God knows what is being communicated. These deep, wordless expressions by the Holy Spirit on our behalf do not go unheard. They're not misunderstood. They don't sound like the adults in some Charlie Brown cartoon. You know, somebody's talking, but it just comes out wah, 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 and nobody knows what's being said. And it is precisely because they are communicated by the living, holy, personal Spirit of God. They are therefore perfect, effective, and answered prayers. Notice, he who searches the hearts is the subject of the sentence. Who is the one who searches the hearts? That's God himself. Jeremiah 17.10 says this, I, Yahweh, search the heart, I test the mind. The psalmist knew this and expressed this in the 139th Psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. 1 Chronicles 28.9, Solomon says this, For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. It is the one who searches the hearts who knows what the mind of the Holy Spirit is. You and I don't have to say something for God to know what it is. We don't have to speak out loud for God to be aware of the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. How many times do we see Jesus in his earthly ministry answer somebody's hidden hidden inner thoughts? This is the one that you should have started being afraid of thinking in front of. Remember Simon the Pharisee? The, the, the sinful woman is in Simon's home. Simon has invited Jesus because Jesus is an important teacher, and Simon the Pharisee considers himself an important teacher, and we're just going to sort of be colleagues and get together and talk about stuff. And, and, and Simon the Pharisee had Jesus in his crosshairs. He was evaluating Jesus. What he did not know is that Jesus had already evaluated him. 
The sinful woman walks into the, comes into the room and begins weeping over her sin and worshiping Jesus, even drying her tears from Jesus' feet with her own hair. And you remember what Simon said out loud? He didn't say it out loud. He thought it in his heart. If Jesus knew what sort of woman this was, he would not let her be doing that. Well, Jesus not only knew what sort of woman that was, but knew what sort of man he was. And so Jesus answered out loud Simon's inner thoughts. Stop thinking in front of Jesus. He knows me. (laughs) And yet for the Christian, for God who searches the hearts to know every thought, every care, every worry, Still comes with, for us with some fear and trepidation, right? God, oh, God knows all of that. But he knows all of that. And he knew all of that when he sent his son to pay for my sins, and he declares over his children no condemnation. And while there are thoughts, there are intentions, there are attitudes that can grieve his Holy Spirit, he doesn't let us go. And along with all the mixed up stuff in our hearts, he also knows the worries, the anxieties, the cares, the concerns. He knows what we need better than we know it ourselves. He is the one who searches the heart to find every tear and every sorrow. He knows. He knows. And the one who searches the heart knows the mindset of the Spirit. He knows the mindset of the Spirit. He knows the mindset of the Holy Spirit. Why? Verse 27, because the Spirit intercedes according to God on behalf of the saints. Why does the Father know the Holy Spirit so well? (laughs) Because the Holy Spirit intercedes according to God's will. That is, there's a standard, and that standard is God's will. And the Holy Spirit communicates an intercessory prayer to meet the perfect standard of the will of God, the perfect standard of His prescriptive will. The Holy Spirit won't pray for something sinful. In His intercessory work, He will not pray with wrong motives or mixed motives or selfish ambition or fear or greed or temporal mindedness or favoritism or friendship with the world. And he prays according to the Father's decretive will. What we do not know in our finitude and weakness, God himself knows. And the interactions here between the Holy Spirit dwelling in a believer and God in his throne room receiving prayer is a window into the inner Trinitarian fellowship and love of the persons in the Godhead. Just as Jesus prayed for his disciples, including us who know him here in this room in John 17, in intercessory prayer, so the Holy Spirit on a daily, experiential, personal basis expresses those things to God as he dwells in the believer that are in keeping with their most pressing needs in their specific circumstances for their own personal experience, and he takes them before his Father, cleaned up, Edited, scrubbed, fixed, sanctified, perfect, effectual, answered. What a remarkable ministry of God to not leave us as orphans, to not leave us alone, to not leave us in our own weakness where God could only answer what we pray and we just don't even know what to pray. But God knows what we should pray and has given us a person, the Holy Spirit, to dwell in us, to intercede on our behalf according to his perfect will. The word for intercede here means an earnest request via personal contact with the person addressed. The Holy Spirit feels this need and earnestly takes it before the Father and personally addresses Him with our deepest needs. This is perfect inter-Trinitarian conversation. The persons of the Godhead are in league together. They are perfectly coordinated. They have a unity of purpose and desires and affections. 
And listen, we are not uninvolved in this. In verse 26, it is our weakness, it is we who do not know how to pray as we should, but, but it is us who are praying and the Holy Spirit intercedes. That is, the Holy Spirit is not giving blanket prayers that apply to all Christians, but He is interceding on our behalf personally, individually. And God is the knower of the hearts in verse 27. That is, He knows your heart personally. He knows your needs in your given circumstances personally. And so the Holy Spirit resides in the believer. God knows our hearts. The Holy Spirit prays as a go-between as we pray and fixes our prayers on the way up. Have you ever wondered what Paul meant in Ephesians 3, 20? Listen to this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond, listen to all those words, far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. What is that power working within us that God knows to do far and above all beyond what we know to ask or even what we know to think? To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. How will I endure life in a broken universe? How will I persevere in and through unknown, unforeseen trials? How can I know God's will? How will I know what to pray for? The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. 1 John 5.14 says this, This is the confidence which we have before God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Praise God that he has made provision for prayer according to his will. And just like everything in the Christian life, anything good doesn't come from me. All from him and through him and to him, to him be the glory forever. Amen. I want you to fast forward in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. This is the scene where John the Apostle is given to bitter weeping because no one is found worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. That is, no one is worthy to usher in God's future judgment over the earth dwellers. And John is weeping because no one can vindicate God's glory on the earth. No angel, no creature, not those four living creatures, not the myriads of angels, the the hosts of armies surrounding the throne. Nobody can do it. And an angel tells him, stop weeping, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to break the seals. That is, to usher in the judgment that follows in 6 through 19, leading up to the return of Christ. He's worthy to do that. The one who was judged for sinners is the right judge over the earth to judge sin. And he's coming. And John, of course, turns and, and looks for this lion, and what does he see? lamb, standing as if slain. That is, in the future, in heaven, still bearing the marks of his substitutionary death on the cross in the place of sin. And this lion and the lamb in the center of these concentric circles of worship in heaven. And in this scene, notice verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. What are these golden bowls full of incense? Do you see it? The prayers of the saints. Staggering. In this climax of human history, here here the the rightful king of the earth, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, is about to unleash his vengeance against sinners who will not repent, and he is about to come and reign on the earth. And, And all of heaven is gathered around this climactic recognition that Jesus Christ is the rightful heir of all things. 
and, and these four living creatures that you and I would be terrified of if we saw them. And these regal 24 elders surrounding the throne and the myriads and myriads of angels gathered around, all focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and right there in the, in, the, in the middle of this scene are these bowls, golden bowls of incense, which are your prayers, Christian. Precious in the sight of God, strategic in the plan of God, there for all of heaven, right at the center as a pleasing aroma before him. Listen, Christian, you must know that when you pray with your mixed motives, your limited view, residual sin tainting, with your misunderstandings, your temporal mindedness, the worldliness we must put to death. When you cry out feebly, weakly before the Lord, help. This is precious in the sight of God. And it's purified, sanctified, set apart for heaven-worthy worship by the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you. So Christian, pray. And let's do that now. God, we come to you with the boldness purchased by the blood of your Son and with the humility and trembling in keeping with approaching Almighty God. We address you as Father with all the affections of calling out Daddy, Abba. And we come to you with our limited understandings, our weakness, our tremblings, our fear, our anxieties, our cares, and we cast them before you. And we just want to express right now to you, O oh God, our gratitude that as we pray, and we don't know what we should pray for, that you do. And your Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Pleading on our behalf according to your will. What a great comfort this is in our time of need. Oh God, give us hearts to pray more. To depend upon you more. To, to be more aware of our need. And to cling to this precious promise. We thank you for our advocates before you, the Holy Spirit advocating for us in prayer and your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, advocating in our stead for our sin, having been declared righteous by your grace. We come to you with confidence even now to sing this song. It's in Jesus' name.